Hello again everyone. In this video we're going to take a look at some of the advanced features that you can do with Oracle tables. In the previous video we took a look at creating a standard table inside of Oracle and that's probably what you'll do 99% of the time. But Oracle provides you with a couple of other table features that allow you to do some really cool things and we're going to take a look at that in this video. Uh, if you've watched my other videos, you know that I like using SQL Developer a lot. SQL Developer is great for giving you a uh, graphical way of looking at your Oracle database. And it gives you a lot of tools and a lot of wizards to go out there and create objects like tables. So if you've watched my other videos, you know that you can go in here as whatever you use your, your logged on as. And if you right click on any of these different types inside of SQL Developer, you can create a new package, new procedure, functions, anything that you want. So I'm going to right click on tables and say I'm going to create a new table. And if you've seen my other video on um, the basics of creating a table, you know that this is what the basic wizard looks like. If I want some of the advanced features, I have to click on this advanced checkbox over here. Once I click on that, I have access to not only the normal tables that are out there, but these other types of tables, external, index organized, temporary transaction, temporary session. And that's what we're going to take a look at in this video. We're going to start with external tables. An external table allows you to treat a flat file that's sitting on your server in the file system that's not part of your Oracle database as if, as if it was a table inside your Oracle database. What's the advantages of doing this? Well, you can have a flat file that you can then run select statements, insert statements, update statements, all these really cool things that you can do inside an Oracle database on this data that's actually not part of an Oracle database. It's a really cool feature. It's a real nice way of allowing you to grab a whole bunch of different data sources, maybe have them in a comma delimited file, maybe you're exporting them from a tool like Excel, and then you can start using them as part of your queries inside your Oracle database without actually having to load the data in. Really nice feature. So we're going to take a look at that now. Before we define the columns for our external table, let's take a look at this external table properties. First thing we have here is the directory, and that's going to specify, OK, where am I going to find uh, this particular flat file that I want to have an external table reference to? And if I hit the drop-down box here, you can see that I have all of these default directories. Where are these coming from? Data file directory, data pump directory. Well, one of the things that you can do inside your Oracle database is define a directory that you're going to reference at the operating system level. So I'm going to cancel out of here real quick. And you can see of all the different objects I can create inside my database, there's this thing here for directories. And if I click the plus sign here, you can see here's the list of all the different directories that are, exist inside my database right now. Data file directory, data pump directory. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to create a new directory reference. So I just say create directory and it asks for a name and a database server directory. In this example, let me hop into uh, this tool here called um, Explorer. I am going to reference this external demo.txt file in my C demo underscore dir directory. So I'm going to copy that and I have to give it a name here. So I'm going to call it external demo directory and I'm going to put, paste in the directory at the operating system level that I want to reference. So in this example, it's C colon demo dir. Click on apply. External demo dir has been created. So now if I go back into tables and I say I want a new table and I want advanced and I want an external table and then the external table properties and I do the drop down box, you can see there's external demo directory. So I'm going to select that guy Then I'm going to say, OK, well, what's the actual file in that directory? And the actual file in that directory is this external demo.txt. So if I click on that, do a control C, I'm going to add that location here, make sure I add the txt. And you can see I'm not limited to a single file. I can have multiple files that are referenced uh, through this table, external table reference. In this example, I just have the one um, I just have the one file, so I'm just going to leave it like that. I'm going to hop back into columns now, and I'm going to define the columns that make up this particular external table. So what does this external table look like? Well, if I pull it up in an editor, you can see I have uh, an employee number, last name, first name, social security number, email address, and this is a department number. One of the things that you have to be sensitive to is to make sure that you have the right format for the way 
uh, this file is set up. And what do I mean by the right format? Well, if I, in this particular editor, I use this editor called Notepad++. In this particular editor, I can click on this little paragraph symbol here, and it'll show me uh, all of the different characters. So you can see the lines are separated by what's called a control a carriage return line feed. If I wanted to change that for whatever reason, I can actually go in there under edit and end of line conversion. I can change it to Unix format. You can see it takes away the control carriage returns. It just leaves the line feeds in there. I can change it to Mac format, which is just the carriage returns with the line feeds. Or I can change it to my Windows format, which is carriage return line feeds. Got to make sure that you have the right formatting. Uh, depending on the system that you're working on. I'm doing this on a Windows box. If I were to use an editor here to edit this file and then FTP it over to a Linux machine, um, the external reference wouldn't work because I'd have these control, uh, I keep saying control, carriage return line feeds in here where uh, at the Unix level Unix doesn't recognize that as a legitimate end of line marker. I'd have to convert it to the system that I was looking at. So you have to make sure uh, that that's set up properly. So this file is set up properly. I'm going to save it just to be on the safe side. So I got my external demo. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back in here and I'm going to define my columns. Well, the first column was uh, just an employee ID. I'll say that's... Um, I'm just going to leave them all as varchar twos for now. Then we have last name. I'll make that a little bigger. I'll make that a 50. Then we got first name. I'll make that a 50. Then we have social security number. And I know it's always going to be nine, but you never know in the future. Maybe I'll have foreign employees. Uh, so I'll just leave that as 20 for now. Then we had email address. I'll make that bigger because some people have really big email addresses. And then finally, department. And I'm just leaving all that as it is right now. I'll give this table a little different name. I'll say this is external. So if I look at the DDL statement now, you can see here's my definition. What tells the DDL that this is in fact an external table is this organizational external here. Um, it defines uh, the directory, the actual file name, reject limit. We're going to talk about that in a second. So now that it looks like I have all my columns set up properly, let's go to external table properties and start looking at some of these different things. Well, we've already defined what the default directory was. We already said what that's going to be. The access driver, I have the ability to either use the Oracle Loader or the Oracle Data Pump. Data Pump gives me a few more uh, features that are available, but you can't use row IDs to select data when you're using an Oracle Data Pump. So because I don't have any indexes on this particular table, I'm just going to leave it as Oracle Loader for now. Reject limit specifies how many I'm going to process, how many rows I'm going to process if the data doesn't match what I've defined here. So I've defined all of these as, you know, varchar twos and the spaces here. We're going to use commas as a delimiter. If for whatever reason the data doesn't fit into these parameters, I'm going to start rejecting information. I'm going to create a, a text file in this external demo directory that lists all of the different rejects that I have. How many can I specify? Well, I want to keep it at zero. I don't want anything to be rejected for this particular case, so I'm going to keep that at zero. So anytime I do an insert, a select, an update, any kind of a query or update uh, or insert against the data that's in this particular file, anything that doesn't fit is going to write it out immediately to uh, a log file that I can take a look at. The project column, this is a little confusing. This says, okay, how do I want to reject the rows? when I find rows that um, don't match what my definitions are. Again, when I hit columns here, if I, if I hit, come across rows that don't match that information, how do I want to reject it? Well, if I select all, basically anything that doesn't fit, I'm immediately going to reject and say, OK, I'm going to throw it into this log file for users to look at later. If I change this to referenced, let's say I write a select statement that selects employee ID, social security number, and department. If L name and F name are screwed up, but employee ID, social security number, and department are all okay, I'm going to allow that to proceed. I'm only going to reject rows when I come across an actual referenced column inside my statement. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'm just going to let it pass. If I Again, if I set this to all, then whatever it is, uh, when I try to select a row, if it doesn't fit into my definition for whatever reason, uh, I'm going to reject it. 
So if I take a look at the DDL, you can see that, again, I'm defining the table. Here's my organization external, and here's where I specify all of the different things that go along with uh, the specification for my external table. So I'm going to click on OK. Oracle doesn't do any checks when you define the external table reference. That file might exist, it may not exist, the directory might exist, the directory might not exist, the columns may be all screwed up. Oracle doesn't do any checking. The only time it does any kind of checking is when you actually start writing statements against that table when you start doing selects or inserts or anything like that. So if I scroll down, I see uh, here's external emps, and you can see there's a little arrow here at the top of my icon to show that it's an external table. And if I go into data, I can actually query all of that information and again do any kind of inserts or updates or deletes or anything like that to this data. And you can see I'm actually pulling back the data through a select statement and because everything is set up properly uh, I don't have any kind of error messages. And I can check to see if uh, there was any, if there was a file that ended in BAD here. If uh, I saw that those would be actually bad rows, rows that didn't conform to the uh, definitions that I had set up for the external table reference. So what other tables do we have available to us? Let's go back up here again and let's say new table and again I click on advanced. So we know what external tables are, right? Those are tables that are sitting at the operating system level that I'm going to define uh, the, my metadata for so that I can start doing SQL statements against those records. An indexed organized table is just like a normal table except for the fact that all the data that goes along with the table is stored in the index. Under normal circumstances, you have an index structure and you have a data structure, right? So when you query information, Oracle says, oh, I found an index on this guy. Uh, here's the information. Now I know where to actually find the information in the data files. I'll go grab that block out of the data file, pull it back to the user. So this is a two-step process there. Indexed organized tables store all of the data along with the index. Now you would say, well, that's, that's awesome, right? I don't have to do that two-step process. As soon as I find the index, I pull back all of the information that's associated with that table. I can pull back information. I can save uh, storage space inside my Oracle database. Why wouldn't I use indexed organized tables all the time? Indexed organized tables are really good for when you know you're always going to query the data by the index. If you ever have to query some other column that's not part of the index, it's not going to work really well. It'll, you'll still find your information, obviously, but it's going to be very inefficient. So indexed organized tables are great if you know you're always going to query data by the index. So if you look at a typical table here, let's go into uh, some other user. And let me scroll down to other users. And I'll go to my HR user and look at a typical table. And let's say employees. So I pull back all my information here. I can take a look at the uh, constraints, which will show me the primary key. Uh, there's my primary key, uh, employee ID uh, primary key right there. Let me sort. Whoops, can't sort by that. Darn it, it's not going to let me do that. So that's the primary key on my table, em employee ID primary key. Uh, and it's going to pull back uh, information based on the primary key. And what is the primary key in this case? In this case, it is... Uh, based on the index employee ID uh, primary key index and then if we take a look at the primary key index we can see that the primary key index is based on the employee ID column so if I know I will always query information based on the employee ID column this would be a good candidate for an index organized table what are the odds of that pretty low right a typical HR table employees, I'm probably looking up stuff like last name, I'm probably looking up stuff by hire date, I'm probably querying information based on salary or manager ID. It's very rare that I'm, it's probably very unlikely that the only way I would ever query information from this particular table is to go against the employee ID. So this would not be a good candidate to be an, uh, an indexed organized table. But again, if you do have that scenario where you know you have a primary key and that's the only way you're ever going to query information from a particular table, then an indexed organized table is uh, a good solution for you. So let's click on tables again and we have a couple of other tables here right we have temporary transaction and temporary session so let's click on click on temporary transaction here for a minute and let's just go right to DDL what in in the world is a temporary transaction table a temporary transaction table is a table that 
once information is committed, all the rows of a particular table are deleted. Why in the world would you ever want a situation like that? Well, let's say you're doing some complex work inside your database and you need like a, a sandbox area. You just need an area where you, you're going to set up a table and maybe you want to insert a couple of rows and you want to manipulate the rows. It's part of a really complex type of transaction, but you don't want that information to stick around. A temporary table is a real easy way of doing that, where it's kind of a scratch table. You have an area that's kind of a, an area that you can put in information temporarily. And the only difference between transactional temporary tables and session temporary tables is the on statement here at the end. So you can see that as a tra uh, for a transactional temporary table, as soon as a commit is issued, all of the rows are deleted and the table goes away. For temporary session, the, s the rows stick around. The, this temporary table sticks around until the actual session, your connection to the database ends. So there may be a situation where you want to preserve this information. Again, you're doing some kind of complex manipulation of data inside your database and you just want to have a scratch area that you can kind of write information out. A temporary session table where it says on commit preserve rows, this global temporary table will continue to exist until the session actually ends. A transactional table, like I said, will only exist until uh, you do a commit. As soon as you do the commit, this temporary table go goes away. And you can see that you can set up your table just like you're setting up a normal table. It can have a primary key, it can have unique constraints, check constraints, indexes, it can have all these different things associated with it. But again, these are just temporary tables. They don't exist forever. They're just there for a short period of time. Uh, hopefully this video gives you some really good insight as to some of the complex things that you can do with Oracle tables.